Historic Royals with Secret Tattoos. Thank you to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Tattoos have a long and colorful history across the world and are an important part of many cultures. While one in three Americans today has at least one tattoo, in the West, the art form is still largely seen as counterculture, risque, and rebellious. You might be shocked to learn that your grandma was inked, and you certainly wouldn't expect that the prim and proper royals of the Victorian era were concealing covert tattoos under their stiff dress uniforms and frilly gowns. But in fact, a handful of trend-setting princes in the late 19th century started an aristocratic craze for secret ink. Let's take a journey through the history of tattoo, learn how it flourished on other continents but passed Europe by, and was then enthusiastically reintroduced. Along the way, we'll meet several royals from history who were secretly tatted up. Tattooing has been practiced by many cultures across the world since the Neolithic times. Early tattoos were created by cutting open the skin with a sharp stone or bone and inserting black soot from the fire. Once the wound healed over, the dark design remained. This simple technology developed simultaneously in various parts of the world. The oldest discovery of tattooed human skin is found on the body of Utzi the Iceman, who is discovered in the Austrian Alps and dates from between 3370 and 3100 BCE. His 61 tattoos of parallel lines on his spine, knees, ankles, and wrists may have been an early form of pain relief to treat his arthritis. But no other members of his culture have been discovered, so we don't know if they were all tattooed or if he was the odd man out. The oldest figurative tattoos were found on two mummies from Egypt, dating slightly later. The man has a large bull on his chest. A priestess of the Egyptian goddess Hathor was found with spiral designs on her thighs, hands, and abdomen, and a hieroglyphic meaning do good on her throat. Other ancient inked human remains have been found in Greenland, Alaska, Mongolia, China, Sudan, the Philippines, Siberia, and the Andes. Around 1500 BCE, people in Taiwan developed new tattooing technology. Sharp needles made from citrus thorn, fishbone, or turtle or oyster shell were used to insert ink into the skin. The comb of needles were attached to a length of wood, which was tapped into the skin with a wooden mallet. This revolutionary method was used by Austronesian people as they populated the islands of the Pacific, and a rich tattooing tradition developed. In Samoa, extensive tattoos were a sign of strength and endurance, as sessions were long, painful, and could lead to infection and even death. Enduring the ordeal was a prerequisite to becoming a chief. Those who could not withstand the pain wore their unfinished tattoos as a mark of shame. Long tattooing traditions exist in many other cultures, including the Ainu people of Japan and several tribes in West Africa and North and South America. Inuit legends tell of how the raven and the loon tattooed each other. People were tattooed via a needle and thread dipped into seal oil, which was sewn through the skin. Women in particular were tattooed to commemorate milestones, including first menstruation. Some believed a woman could not enter the spirit world if she did not have a tattoo on her skin. Young Iroquois boys went on a spiritual quest alone into the woods. While fasting and often consuming narcotics, they would have a vision of their personal Manitou. This animal was tattooed on their skin and was believed to protect them in battle. Berber girls of North Africa received their first facial tattoo at the onset of puberty. Popular designs include the Yaz, representing freedom, the sun, animals, plants, and geometric designs. Aside from Utsi, European cultures have been left largely unembellished for the last few millennia. Ancient Greeks and Romans used tattooing to mark and shame people who were imprisoned or enslaved. This led to a strong stigma against body art. When the Romans arrived in Britannia, they were terrified by the painted people, whom they labeled the Picts. 
These warriors from modern-day Wales and Scotland went into battle nearly naked and covered in elaborate designs, rendered in blue woad dye. Archaeological evidence of permanent tattoos is scant, and it is believed that the Picts were actually sporting war paint, which was washed off after battle. Either way, the sight of the marked-up Picts so horrified the rigid Romans that they declared Britannia too wild to conquer. The few additional historic accounts of Europeans encountering tattoos puts those sporting them firmly in the other category. In the 10th century, a Viking trader wrote of meeting Rus people in Eastern Europe who were heavily tattooed. From the tip of his toes to his neck, each man is tattooed in dark green designs. Following the Norman conquest of England, historian William of Malmesbury described the Anglo-Saxons having arms covered in golden bracelets, tattooed with colored patterns. According to one historic account, after the Battle of Hastings, King Harold Godwinson's mangled corpse was identified by his wife, Queen Edith, by private marks on his chest only she knew about. These may have been birthmarks or scars, but some have suggested that they were tattoos. Legend has even grown that the penultimate Anglo-Saxon king was inked with the words Edith and England, though this sentimental story has no basis in evidence hand-in-hand hand with the perception of tattooing being barbaric. The Abrahamic religions viewed all types of body modification as a mutilation of God's work. Thus, there is a strong taboo against tattoos amongst most Jews, Christians, and Muslims. In the 200s, Roman Emperor Constantine converted his empire to Christianity, and he banned tattoos. Thus, tattooing culture mostly passed Europe by for the next 2,000 years, though it did not disappear completely. The Copts, Christians in North Africa and the Middle East, who refused to convert during the Muslim conquest, have a long tradition of tattooing. Adherents commonly have a Coptic cross tattooed on the inside of their right arm. During the Crusades, many Christian pilgrims and knights got tattooed, often by Coptics. They wanted to commemorate their harrowing journeys and permanently mark their allegiance to religious orders. The Knights of St. John of Malta often inked their eight-pointed cross. Part of the appeal was that if a soldier was slain in battle, the holy symbol emblazoned on his flesh would mark him out from his Muslim enemies and ensure that he was given a Christian burial. King Richard the Lionheart, who went on crusade in 1191, and King Henry IV, who went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in 1392, both reportedly got permanent souvenirs of their journeys. During the Age of Exploration, when Europeans encountered tattooed people in North and South America, they looked down on them and their body art. Missionaries tried, and often succeeded, to convince them that their practices were wrong, leading to the erasure of tattoo culture in many places. In 1690, a young man named Jolie from the modern-day Philippines was captured, taken to England, and displayed as a curiosity, under the name The Painted Prince. Jolie's owners made up stories that he was the son of a king and that his many tattoos were drawn by his five wives and made from herbal pigments which protected him from venomous snakes. After two years in England, Jolie died of smallpox. His body was preserved by the University of Oxford but has since been lost. Between 1766 and 1779, Captain James Cook made three voyages to the South Pacific, visiting numerous islands. He and his crew reported home about the many tattooed people they had seen and the methods they witnessed. They introduced the word tattoo into the European lexicon. It came from a Tahitian word and refers to the sound of the wooden tattoo mallets being tapped together. Before then, metaphorical words like pricked, marked, engraved, decorated, punctured, stained, and embroidered were used. Cook brought back to London a tattooed Raia Teon man named Omai, who was presented to King George III. Omai was treated better than Jolie and became a darling of high society. After a two-year stay, he returned home. 
Many in Cook's crew volunteered to sit under the needle themselves. They started a craze amongst European sailors who got inked by local artists while visiting posts in the Pacific, or by other sailors who developed their technique and artistry during the many dull hours of long voyages. As in other cultures, sailor tattoos took on symbolic significance and marked milestones or protected from the perils of the sea. A swallow tallies each 5,000 nautical miles journeyed, and a turtle commemorates crossing the equator. Hold fast, written across the knuckles, was believed to give a good grip on the rigging, and a nautical star meant a sailor would always find their way home. The popularity of tattoos spread to many other sailor-adjacent subcultures, including pirates, sex workers, criminals, prisoners, and soldiers. According to a prevailing legend, a young French soldier named Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, swept up in revolutionary fervor, got the popular motto, Mour à Roi, or Death to Kings, tattooed on his arm. The officer rose through the ranks and became a general under Napoleon Bonaparte. In 1812, Swedish diplomats came to the emperor to ask for a recommendation. Their king, Carl VIII, was old and childless. They needed a new king to start a fresh royal dynasty, and they alighted on Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte as an exceptional candidate. The general was all too happy to forget his youthful malice towards monarchs and be elected heir to the Swedish throne. He further impressed his new people by battling their longtime enemy, Denmark, and forcing them to hand over Norway, doubling the size of his kingdom. In 1818, Jean-Baptiste was crowned King Carl XIV Johann. His majesty was careful never to reveal his Death to Kings tattoo, especially when being anointed with holy oil during his coronation. Karl ruled over Sweden for 26 years. When he died in 1844, his children continued the Bernadotte dynasty, which is still on the Swedish throne today. While the tale of the king's death to king's tattoo is ironically hilarious, unfortunately it isn't true. Bernadotte's tattoo was invented by two French playwrights, Van der Bruch and Longlet, for their 1833 comedy, Le Camarade de Lee. The story of the king's anti-monarchist tattoo struck such a chord that it has often been repeated as fact since. However, there is no historic evidence that that king of Sweden had a revolutionary or any other ink on his skin. If you're like me, you enjoy staying up to date on the news, especially anything royal related. From exploring the historical significance of recent events to getting the latest headlines, news has become increasingly biased and divisive, making it harder than ever to get the full picture behind the stories you care about. That's why I've been enjoying Ground News. This website and app is designed to give readers an easy, data-driven, and objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. Take a look at this recent story about Prince Harry visiting King Charles after his cancer diagnosis. On Ground News, I can read a summary of the story and see how many publications are covering it. Looking at the bias distribution chart, I can see that 31% of them lean left and 36 lean right. The factuality chart shows me that only 38% of reporting outlets are rated as highly factual, so I can focus on reading their articles. One of my favorite ground news features is the blind spot feed, which shares stories that are underrepresented by either the left or the right. It helps you escape your own echo chamber. Try ground news today and get 40% off their Vantage plan which gives you unlimited access to all of their features. This offer is only available through my link, so go to ground.news slash history tea time. And for less than $5 a month, you can make reading the news easier, more enjoyable, and less polarizing. And now, back to history. Because tattoos were associated with the rougher elements of European society, they were viewed down the noses of the upper class 
at least publicly. However, there were plenty of nobles and royals who secretly admired the counterculture and longed for ink of their own. Captain Cook's science officer and botanist, Sir Joseph Banks, returned home with a tattoo. He was a highly regarded and wealthy member of the aristocracy, and he inspired a few other members of the upper crust to get tattooed. At first, these lords had to get their ink while traveling the world. In 1862, Queen Victoria's eldest son and heir, Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, went on an official royal tour of the Holy Lands. While there, the 21-year-old prince recorded in his diary, In the evening, I was tattooed by a native. The design the prince chose was a Jerusalem cross, a pattern consisting of five crosses, representing Christ and the four evangelists. This design had been inked on the flesh of thousands of pilgrims and crusaders before it graced the arm of the future king. But, as royals often do, the prince set off a craze for tattoos amongst the aristocracy. Bertie was so pleased with this near-sacred, formative experience that he often recounted the tale and showed off his tatted arm to his friends and his many mistresses, including Jenny Jerome. She was an American heiress with Iroquois ancestry. At 16, she toured Europe with her mother and had a blazing affair with the Prince of Wales, which eventually simmered into a lifelong friendship. Jenny stayed in the UK by marrying Lord Randolph Spencer Churchill, the second son of the Duke of Marlborough. Their son, Winston, would be one of Britain's most celebrated prime ministers. Jenny was a daring woman who wasn't afraid to break taboos, according to a story which appeared in the San Francisco Call in 1894. While she was on an around-the-world cruise, she saw a sailor tattooing a deckhand. Though her husband protested, she asked the artist to tattoo her as well. He suggested an Ouroboros, a serpent biting its own tail, which is an ancient Egyptian symbol for eternity. Jenny was charmed by the imagery and presented her wrist for marking. Her Ouroboros was supposedly rendered in bright blue ink with green eyes and a red jaw. The story claims that Lady Churchill covered the tattoo with a wide gold bracelet and only revealed it to her friends and presumably her lovers. However, there is no photographic evidence of the tattoo. Jenny may have even spread false rumors about it herself to boost her mysterious prestige. That was part of the appeal of tattoos. In the prim and proper Victorian era, the buttoned-up public facade hid a steamy underbelly of kinky, forbidden sex, and wondering what sheer undergarments or exotic art a potential lover was hiding underneath their bespoke tuxedo or frilly evening gown was the height of titillation. A few years after the trend-setting Prince of Wales got his Jerusalem cross, his uncle, Prince Alfred Duke of saxe coburg and Gotha, a longtime member of the Navy who saw several tours of duty around the world, got a tattoo in Japan, an illustration of the prince in shirt sleeves playing a game of bowls is the only known image which reveals his writhing dragon tattoo. Dragons were a popular subject in Japanese art, and as Japan opened to the West in the late 1800s, there was a craze for Japanese art in Europe. Prince Bertie's two sons, Albert Victor and George, were both sent off with the Navy when they were boys. While sailing the world, the 17- and 16-year-old princes made a stop in Japan in 1881. George wrote home excitedly to his beloved mother, Alexandra of Denmark, informing her that he had gotten a tattoo, just like Papa. He described meeting an artist who could complete a large dragon in blue and red, writhing all down the arm in about three hours. This was probably Karakusa Gunta, the finest tattooist of the time, who came to the prince's guest house in Tokyo. George further recounted that, although the ink was applied with many very minute needles, we did not find the pricking hurt at all, but this varies with different people. On a second stop in Kaito, Prince Albert Victor was tattooed with a dancing crane on his upper arm, while Prince George received a tiger on the arm opposite the dragon. The tiger and dragon represented the British Empire's possessions in Eastern and Western Asia. 
The prince's tats were no secret. They were eagerly described with illustrations in British newspapers. George liked his ink so much that a few years later he got a Jerusalem cross to match his father's. His cousin, the future Tsar Nikolai II of Russia, also visited Japan, went to the same tattooist, and got a similar dragon on his own arm. The cousins who looked startlingly alike now had matching ink as well. Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria also got a dragon tattoo while visiting Japan. Once it was public knowledge that royals were sporting permanent souvenirs, everyone wanted one, but they couldn't all hop on a ship to Japan. This gave opportunity for tattooists from the Navy and Army to open the first tattoo parlors in the UK. They served high-class clientele on the Strand and German Street in the West End, where fresh ink did not come cheap. Japanese designs were popular, as were family crests, horses, dogs, and other hunting paraphernalia, and sexy French salon images. In 1891, American tattooist Samuel O'Reilly patented the first electric tattooing machine, which was based on a Thomas Edison invention. It allowed for more precise, less painful tattoos. English tattooist Sutherland MacDonald created inks in a variety of colors. Before him, tattoos could only be done in black and red, and the red was made from toxic cinnabar mercury. Former sailor George Bruchette became the first celebrity tattooist and was known as the king of tattooists. He was renowned for his designs incorporating exotic motifs collected from his travels around Asia and Africa. He also developed cosmetic tattooing, including permanently darkening the eyebrows. The king of tattooists worked on two actual kings, Alfonso XIII of Spain and Frederick IX of Denmark. Soon, kings and princes from all over Europe were lining up to get inked. Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, King Oscar II of Sweden, King Ferdinand I of Romania, King George II of Greece, Crown Prince Rudolf of Austria, and Prince Christian Victor of Schleswig-Holstein all had tattoos. Many of them sported ornate renditions of their family coats of arms. King Alexander of Yugoslavia went a bit more daring and had a vivid eagle tattooed across his chest. Grand Duke Alexis of Russia, fifth child of Tsar Alexander II, was also put into the Navy at the age of seven. He was sent to America to meet President Taft and went out west to hunt buffalo. During his travels, Alexis got numerous tattoos. In Japan, he had his entire right arm inked with an elaborate dragon. The Grand Duke became one of the most tattooed men in Europe, though he had no visible ink outside of his naval uniform. Royal ladies were more discreet, but plenty of them were inked as well. Grand Duchess Olga Konstantinovna of Russia, who later became Queen of Greece and was the grandmother of Prince Philip, is believed to have had several designs. Empress Elizabeth of Austria loved to travel often to get away from her overbearing, milquetoast husband, Emperor Franz Joseph. While on a trip to Greece, the 51-year-old empress had a sailor tattoo an anchor on her shoulder to represent her love of the sea and travel. When she returned home, her husband was appalled. He asked their daughter, Marie Valerie, if she had wept when she saw what her mother had done. But the teenage princess replied that she found her mother's tattoo very original and certainly not so terrible. Princess Marie of Orléans was the great-granddaughter of Louis-Philippe I, the penultimate king of France. She wed Prince Valdemar of Denmark and was thus sister-in-law to Edward VII. Marie was a royal rebel, bohemian, and artist. She shocked her relatives by spending time with her husband's naval friends, playing cards and swearing. She also got an anchor tattooed on her arm in honor of her husband. Her ink was easy to see when she wore an evening gown, and she displayed it proudly, exclaiming, Let them complain, I am just as happy nevertheless. In 1898, Harmsworth magazine estimated that one in five members of the gentry had a tattoo. It was even whispered that Queen Victoria herself had a tattoo of a dragon and python hiding under the sleeve of her dress, though most historians find this story pretty hard to credit. While Her Majesty may not have been amused by tattoos, 
plenty of her subjects got her visage inked on their own skin. George Burchette reported to a newspaper, When the Queen died in 1901, I had to work until midnight and every Sunday for several weeks, executing tattoos in memory of our Queen. In 1906, Edward VII, now king, sent his 23-year-old nephew, Prince Arthur of Connaught, to Japan to present the Order of the Garter to Emperor Magi. While at his hotel, Arthur received the tattooist Hori Uno, who produced for him an image of Fodo Mayo'o, the God of Fire, this popular image of a god with a flaming sword defending the faithful from evil is seen in many Buddhist temples. In 1922, George V's son and heir, Edward Prince of Wales, made his own visit to Japan. He hoped to follow the family tradition and get a tattoo to commemorate his trip. The prince wrote back to his father, My chief disappointment is not being able to get tattooed in Japan, but it seems it's been made illegal. Under these conditions, I've left it severely alone. In Japan, tattoos had long been associated with the floating world subculture of sex work and organized crime. King Frederick IX of Denmark was another royal who grew up in the navy and had the tats to prove it. As a young man, the prince acquired multiple anchors, his family crest, and three dragons, which were tattooed on trips to Japan, Thailand, and China. When Frederick acceded the throne in 1947, he was given the nickname the Tattooed King. After World War II, tattoos fell out of fashion. The Nazi practice of forcibly tattooing numbers onto the arms of concentration camp victims soured many on the art form. Tattoos once again became visible symbols of the counterculture. They were looked down on by the middle and upper class, many of whom never knew that their grandparents had secret tattoos under their dressing gowns. Tattoos have continued to fall in and out of fashion. They were hot with millennial hipsters, but are less loved by Gen Z. Still, many modern royals sport tattoos, as their ancestors once did. King Frederick X of Denmark, the grandson of the tattooed king, has a shark on his right calf to commemorate his own time in the navy. Princess Stephanie of Monaco has at least six tattoos, including designs on her upper back and ankle. Princess Eugenie of the UK has a small circle inked behind her left ear, and Lady Amelia Windsor, the great-great-granddaughter of George V, has several small designs. In 2015, Prince Carl Philip of Sweden married reality TV star Sofia Helkvist. Many were surprised to see that the new princess's low-cut wedding dress proudly displayed a sun tattoo between her shoulder blades. She also has a large butterfly on her ribcage and several other small designs. There have been rumors that many other royals, including King Charles III, Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, and Zara Phillips are also tattooed. But, like their Victorian forebears, if they do have ink, they keep it private, and we may never know. Want even more tea on history? Check out the History Tea Time podcast. You can now follow History Tea Time on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.